I'd uh, like to welcome you all for coming today. Um, my name is Matt Raby with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Nebraska Ecological Services Office in uh, Wood River, Nebraska. Uh, real quick on questions, a reminder that if you have that app downloaded, that's how we're going to go ahead and do question and answer period. So go ahead and submit questions in there, even if we don't get to them um, after each of these sessions or at the end of all, all of the sessions. Um, we'll still encourage that each of the speakers can go in there and answer questions online, so that's how we'd like to do that. Um, we'll have 15 minutes for each of these, these speakers, and uh, like I mentioned, um, at the end we can do Q&A if there's a little bit of time. First speaker is Amanda Haig, Conservation Program Associate with National Audubon Society, and it's going to be talking to us about Mitigating crane collisions with power lines at Rose Sanctuary through illumination with ultraviolet light. All right, thank you, Matt. Okay, yeah, so um, as Matt mentioned, I'll be talking about a cool project that we worked on in collaboration with Crane Trust and EDM International um, during spring of 2021, um, where we were looking at a new way to mitigate crane collisions with power lines using ultraviolet light at Audubon's Row Sanctuary, um, right just near Gibbon, Nebraska. And before I dive into the study, I kind of want to talk about a little bit of the background of the issue. Um, so bird collisions with human-made structures are a long-standing conservation issue around the world. Every year, as many as one billion birds die from collisions with buildings, especially ones with glass. Up to 500,000 birds collide with wind turbines. Communication towers kill from four to 50 million birds per year. And it is currently estimated that between eight and 57 million birds are killed in the US annually from collisions with electric utility lines. And this issue of collisions is nothing new. In 1876, Q's published one of the first reports of avian collisions, stating that um, there were over 100 collisions of passerines with a telegraph wire. And this was in three miles of observations. And he concluded, since we cannot conveniently abolish the telegraph, we must be content with fewer birds. And in the 150 years since Q's made his observation, telegraph wires have become obsolete, but other types of suspended wires, such as um, guy wires and power lines, have proliferated, and bird collisions have only continued and expanded. Power lines pose a risk to birds because they are built around the average height that birds fly. And this can be especially dangerous if these um, structures traverse particularly sensitive habitat or um, habitat that birds migrate or um, use as a stopover site. And some birds are more susceptible to collisions than others. And this includes large-bodied birds like waterfowl, cranes, and raptors. And that's because they're just large birds. Um, large birds with large wingspans just can't get out of the way fast enough. They can't maneuver around obstacles. They take larger wing beats. And also, large birds have large wingspans, so they can e easily bridge components of power lines, resulting in electrocution. Specific birds have behaviors that lead to greater collision risk as well. For instance, birds that flock or follow specific pathways um, during their migration or as they move between their foraging habitat and their roosting habitat, and you might get what I'm alluding to here, um, might have greater risk. Landscape characteristics such as pathways that funnel birds through relatively narrow areas that have barriers like rivers surrounded by trees might place birds at higher risk if there are power lines intersecting them. So this is where we come in. Rose Sanctuary, which is located just south of Gibbon, Nebraska, has two main barriers for large-bodied birds like cranes, geese, and raptors. And these are the power lines to the east and the west of our set, uh, main headquarters. And thinking back to the previous picture, you can imagine that these power lines might create a collision risk 
um, to flocks of cranes as they move between their um, foraging habitat to their roosting habitat on the river every single day that they're in the Platte River Valley. And collisions can be pretty fatal for cranes. Um, some cranes are continued, able to continue flying, um, but undoubtedly they're injured. Um, some may fall injured to the sandbar below and become prey for a predator like a coyote, and some cranes just die upon impact. And that just depends on where they hit. Um, many collisions happen with the shield wires, which are the top thinner wires on power lines. Um, and these just are there to help protect, protect the conductor wires against um, lightning strikes. Um, therefore, the impacts, uh, or the impacts could be also worse um, if cranes hit the conductor wires, which are the thicker bottom wires of power lines, um, just because they're thicker and the impact could be worse. Many have observed um, and studied sandhill crane collisions along the Platte River. There are tons of studies on this. Um, at Rose Sanctuary, every year um, we see tens to hundreds of crane collisions with our power lines just to the east and west crossings. And these observations led to the installation of bird flight diverters and uh, firefly line markers on these power lines um, at row. And these were mainly just intended to increase the visibility of these power lines to birds in flight. And um, these fireflies are the, the, hanging, um, the hanging piece on your left and then the bird flight diverters on the right. And lots of studies have taken place since then, um, and researchers um, have been mainly finding that these line markers not only um, cause the cranes to react at greater distances, but they also lead to fewer evasive maneuvers, um, suggesting that these line markers do have some sort of collision mit mitigating effect. But these collisions still do occur, um, and these markers aren't as effective at reducing collisions at night because they're not glow in the dark. I mean, they are reflective, and some are glow in the dark, but um, we still see collisions, and since power lines, we can't bury them, we can't reroute them or modify them, um, Roe needed a new method to prevent collisions at the sanctuary. So like I said, we know that there are generally less, um, generally more collisions at night than during the day, and this combined with the effectiveness of the existing line markers um, suggests that the total illumination of the lines, total line illumination, might be the most promising solution for power line collisions and cranes. So there was a pilot study led by James Dwyer of EDM International. This was published um, in 2019, and he showed that implementing a new type of technology could help to prevent bird collisions with power lines. He hypothesized that illuminating power lines with near ultraviolet light, or that in the spectrum of 395 to 400 nanometers, may reduce crane collisions with in the treated span, either working with the line markers or replacing the need for them entirely. And this system was called the Avian Collision Avoidance System, or how I'll refer to it as ACAS. So this study was conducted on the east power line at Rose Sanctuary, and what they found was that there was a 98% reduction in crane collisions with the power line, and that cranes had fewer um, dangerous reaction types when these ultraviolet lights were turned on. However, this um, this ACAS was largely experimental. I think the serial number was like one or two. And um, it was not working um, extremely efficiently. Um, it tested, they tested it on only one power line. And um, they didn't consider the effects of how weather or the environment played a role in the effectiveness of these lights. <clears throat> so how does it work? Well, the lens of the human eye absorbs ultraviolet light, but humans lack photosensitive cone cells capable of perceiving ultraviolet light. So that prevents its perception by humans. Um, birds, on the other hand, do have unique combinations of cone photoreceptor cell types not found in humans, and they have cone pigments with spectral sensitivity in the ultraviolet range. Um, they also have pigmented oil droplets on those cone cells that help with ultraviolet perception. So these combination of all these features um, leads to this ultraviolet light perception that has been identified in more than half of the bird groups studied. So in the early months of 2021, we coordinated with Dawson Public Power to install two of these ACAS units on the existing H-frame structures to the east and west of the sanctuary um, prior to the arrival of most uh, migrating birds. And here's a map of the location where these units were installed. On the east power line, we installed the ACAS unit on the north bank and illuminated it southward. And on the west side, we um, installed it on the south side and um, illuminated northward. 
and this is a little bit of the anatomy of the whole setup. Um, so those ACAS systems, there are two light boxes that I'll show you in the next slide um, on that, the top of that H-frame structure. And these are powered by solar panels and battery boxes with, fo with photoreceptors on them, so they automatically turn on and off every single day. Each light box contained three LED UV lights with peak illumination in the range of 390 to 400 nanometers. And these were mounted on these cross arm structures um, on both power lines. So um, they were intended to illuminate the entire 260 meter structure across the river span that we were observing. We developed some study questions that were very similar to our 2019 study. And we mainly wanted to know um, more about the effectiveness of this ACAS illumination and how effective it was at reducing um, the number of crane collisions. So we documented collisions, different types of flight behaviors, and numbers um, in terms of individuals and flocks, which is our sampling unit, um, of medium to large bodied birds, including cranes, geese, raptors, um, that crossed our study area. So, um, we expanded our observations from that original study in that we did the east and west uh, power line segments. And we also examined how in different environmental and weather related covariates could influence collision rates and the effectiveness of the ACAS. We monitored both the east and west crossing every night from a blind from late February to early April, and this helped to bracket the period when most collisions are documented to occur at Rose Sanctuary. Um, and then we randomly assigned the ACAS units to be on, off, both on, both off um, between our two lines for each night of observation. Um, we used binoculars to observe from a blind during the day at the base of the atrium structure. Um, and then at night, we used a thermal monocular to watch as cranes flew into our study area. When we were out in the field, we recorded flocks of cranes as they flew into an imaginary box that extended 50 meters beyond each side of the power line and 35 meters tall. And we, when cranes entered into our study area, we recorded height of the entire flock of cranes as well as any reactions that took place. And I won't go into details about those reactions because we don't have time. Um, we recorded the number of cranes in each flock and where any reactions occurred within the flock or collisions um, as they crossed the power line. We also recorded environmental conditions on a per observation and a per night basis um, because we expected that rain, fog, and high wind speeds might lead to collisions and riskier behaviors. And this is just a cool picture of what we were looking at through those um, thermal monoculars. And in circle there, um, you can see where collisions have taken place. We used a tiered model selection approach and also some bivariate tests to understand what influenced the number of cranes that flew into our study area or detection probability, um, what influenced the likelihood of colliding with power lines, and how did their reactions change with power line illumination. And we learned that the ACAS has a pretty significant effect. The first lesson that we learned is that most of the collisions occurred after dark. We recorded 600 or 6,643 flocks during the 40 days of our observations. Um, and 98% of the collisions occurred after dark. One occurred before, 63 after, most were sandhill cranes. We found that in larger flocks, there were more collisions. There were generally a mix of collision types. So some cranes, like I mentioned, fall, fell to the sandbar. Some continued to fly. Um, and then we also found that um, more collisions occurred with the shield wires or those thinner top wires to the power lines and towards the middle of the flock. The second lesson that we learned is that a significantly higher proportion of collisions occurred when the ACAS or the lights were turned off. And our top model indicated that the focal ACAS or the one we were directly observing being on reduced collisions by 88% on our focal line and reduced collisions by 39% on the other line, suggesting that there is some sort of neighboring effect on the other power line when that light is turned off, but the focal line is turned on. Um, so uh, this was actually supported in another study that was published this year um, in the San Luis Valley of Colorado when sandhill cranes avoided not only the illuminated span, but also multiple spans on each site, suggesting that neighboring effect. 
The third lesson we learned was that the ACAS influenced flight behavior. So when power lines were illuminated um, broadly, we found that there are fewer flocks within our study area, cranes tended to fly higher, reacted sooner, and exhibited le less risky reaction types, which is pretty similar to that previous study. And I won't go into great detail on this table, but basically we grouped our reaction types into low, moderate, and high risk behavior categories. And so you can see that some, there were similar numbers of low risk flight types when these ACAS systems were turned off. But there were more high risk flight types when the ACAS was turned off than when it was on. And last, we learned that environmental variables matter. Um, we did have pretty small sample sizes for times when it was raining. Um, so we couldn't get as quite of a good, a, quite as good of an understanding of the impacts of rain on the effectiveness. But one thing that we did find um, was that wind was one of our top covariates in our models. Um, so we found that most collisions occurred at moderate wind speeds, around 10 to 16 kilometers per hour, which might be explained by our observation that cranes were better able to maneuver during low wind speeds, and cr cranes tended to fly higher during high wind speeds. Finally, we didn't observe any negative effects. So we didn't have any human residents complain about the ACAS's light. This is a picture of what it looks like during the daytime. Um, and at night, um, on a clear night, it only is really apparent when you look directly at the ACAS. But um, we did observe that the entire area was kind of illuminated on a foggy night, creating this like eerie, um, oh, sorry. That's what it looks like um, during the night. <laughs> creating some sort of uh, like eerie appearance. And one more slide here. Um, so finally, we found that sandhill cranes and other birds continued to forage and roost in these areas where these ACAS systems were. So we suggest that future applications of this ACAS would benefit from additional research to check for any potential negative effects. For example, collisions involving nocturnal foragers like caprimulgiform birds or bats. Um, to determine if there's any negative effects. And also, future, future research should look into if there are any effects of fog or rain on the effectiveness of the system. And with that, um, I'd like to take questions and um, thank our project funding and support for this cool project. And if you're interested in this study, I put the citation below. It was published in May. Thanks, Amanda. We'll go ahead and um, do questions online oh, for right now, and then um, if we have time at the end, I can read some of those off. Uh, and Amanda can also go in there and, and answer questions online. Our next speaker is Kylie Warren, media specialist, the Crane Trust. And Ky will, Kylie will be talking to us about cranes of blue water. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Crane session. Uh, this is a, a fifth, an hour-long presentation crammed into 15 minutes, so I'm just going to kick it right off. And what Cranes, wa Cranes of Blue Water is, is a virtual story about the cranes that spend their spring staging air during, on the westernmost edge of the central flyway in western Nebraska. It is a visual story about ancient birds, water, and recent history. It is a personal story and a natural story because Blue Water is where I spent a great deal of my childhood. As an adult, I was thrilled to see cranes when I returned to fi uh, film a portion of my doctorate uh, on the Platte Basin. So just a reminder of where we are and a reminder that this first rendition of the project was generously funded by Platte Basin Time Lapse. And speaking of maps, uh, we are all very familiar with the Crane Flyway. But are we familiar with the original land uh, that, that we now stand on? We are currently on um, the, the um, land of the Oyate and the Pawnee, and that land is Kearney. But out west, uh, the Cranes of Blue Water have flown over the land of four different nations five different nations. And so this, this uh, project 
uh, really takes place in a place, uh, in, a, in an area called Llewellyn, and that is what um, uh, we, we now call it in, in, on the legal maps. And it is a, it is a place uh, where, sorry, I'm trying to do notes and, it is an area where Blue Creek meets the North Platte. It is an area uh, that was very important to people as well as migratory animals as uh, Blue Creek travels from north to south and this was a migratory landmark of birds, animals, and even people. Uh, it is a land of the homestead, uh, but it is also a land of a tragic massacre that took place in 1855. It is the land of the Oate, the original people, and it indeed is, it is, it is a land of the Sandhill Cranes that now stage here. And these cranes are ancient birds. Compared to us, they dwarf us in years. They have 11 million years and have survived five Yellowstone eruptions. Sand hills at 2.5 million years have only survived one Yellowstone eruption. We as people have not survived any, and we can't even get through a pandemic without toilet paper. However, thanks to us, cranes are in crisis. They are a family in crisis. And according to Bird Life International, in the last 50, 50 years, 73% of the world's crane population has dropped. And so when we look at the cranes as a family, as a related family, this is what has happened to them. And you can see from that chart that um, luckily our sandhill cranes are very much in a green state. However, our whooping cranes are still struggling. And it is thanks to the land management and the people who care for the land that these cranes are seeing a recovery. But many of the other cranes are in a dire situation. And so after seeing cranes in carefully managed habitats, like Bosque del Apache Rose Sanctuary and the Crane Trust, I wanted to know more about these cranes in my own backyard and in a landscape that's only fragmentally ma managed by people and private landowners as they choose. In 2018, I spent um, my own free time between work uh, going into the field and documenting these cranes. And what I learned was that in those few short weeks, uh, the cranes were populating an area, this, this sacred area of Blue Creek where it joined the North Platte River. Uh, there were many people who cared for them that, that came out from Boulder every year to, uh, to see them in, in our small community despite the fact that we don't have the blinds or the facilities out here out there to uh, really host them. Uh, there are many obstacles for these cranes because of the way the water's been managed and the overgrowth. You can see the trees in many of the backgrounds of my photography. And there's no wide-scale conservation effort or contiguous conservation effort to protect them in our area. According to local legend, cranes have only been returning since the 1990s. Uh, family and friends do not remember seeing them in their childhood. And there were a few people out there trying to tell this story. So that's where Platt Basin Time Lapse came in and uh, agreed to sponsor this story as an Esri Story Maps project. And you can go online and, and see that for yourself. Uh, I will show you the link at the very end of the, the presentation. Uh, because I am truncating this uh, presentation, I'm going to focus now on the process that it took to uh, gather this story together. Uh, I utilized the time-lapse camera that was lent to me very generously, uh, my own uh, blinds and blinds of private landowners who let me borrow theirs. Uh, I had a vehicle. I burnt a lot of fossil, fossil fuels, unfortunately, trying to document these cranes. And then I had the opportunity to go into a plane with Nebraska Game and Wildlife, Park and Wildlife. From the blind, uh, you can get a really intimate look at the cranes. And one of my favorite uh, thing to watch is cranes loafing. And the, cranes have a, a daily routine. They get up on the river, they wake up, they find a field to find some food or corn in. Uh, they, is this playing? Apologies.
All right, well, if you want to see the video, I guess you're going to have to go to Esri Story Maps and watch it there. Apologies for that. Uh, but they do have a routine, and uh, they spend the bulk of their day in wet meadows or wetlands, uh, grazing, preening, resting. They lay down in the grass, so this is a very important rest period for them. We'll see if this next video plays. So in 2020, I had the opportunity of getting to see the cranes bathe, which I thought was really interesting and fun. It's not something that uh, is very accessible. I had to uh, ask very politely a private landowner who let me take my blind onto their land, and I just waited for about 14 hours that day and watched the cranes uh, during that time, and I had to wait for them to leave. But in that time, I got to watch this beautiful moment And so it is a very, uh, it, it's kind of an unusual experience to see this with birds and how many of us are going to let other people watch us bathe and preen and sleep. So we, we're very privileged and, and that owns a lot of respect, I think. So there were also discoveries from the air. Uh, this is Cessna, we flew over and did a practice crane count of the area and it was with Nebraska Game and Park. And what we discovered in 2019 was that it was a very unusual year, largely due to the amount of flooding and ice that we had. Uh, the ice buildup was blocking the rivers and it was making it very hard for cranes to roost where they had roosted in years past. Um, and we had cranes, of, cranes loafing in wet meadows, but we, we weren't really sure where they were going at night. And then when we got into the air, we saw this, land, this line of uh, wetlands. They're actually playas. And I began to wonder if cranes were using the playas as other birds were in the area as a sort of refuge as the rivers were too high. So once on the ground again, I got into my vehicle and took a drive and found evidence of cranes by way of crane feathers and their prints. I was lucky enough to know another landowner who uh, let me borrow her patio for an evening and morning and uh, discovered that cranes were indeed roosting on the playas. And I won't play this whole video, it's about a minute long, but it was kind of stark to see that you go to the river, you wait for them, and there were a few numbers, and then when you went up to the tables, there were so many cranes roosting and taking advantage of these temporary wetlands that had formed due to the abundance of water. And so if you want to see the whole video, S3 Story Maps through Platte Basin Time Lapse. Uh, Obviously, the road routes I took uh, took me quite extensively across Garden County. Uh, in 2018, this was the route I drove in my free time. These areas reflect different activities. The blue is just where you have wetlands. The little beds are where cranes were roosting. The party balloons are loafing, and the spoon and fork is where they were having their meals uh, grazing in the fields. And this is 2019, you can see here on the bottom, this is what we call the table. This is where the abundance of playas was sitting and this is where cranes were spending more time than they had in previous years. And this is a comparative uh, of all the maps merged together from 2018 to 2022. And you can see this on Esri Story Maps. So we discovered some unique things during this migration. Uh, this was a leucistic crane that appeared. She was a great indicator of how long the cranes were staying in the area. She stayed for roughly six weeks. And by being so conspicuous, we could watch her and, and kind of gauge a, a rough timeline of, of when cranes, maybe individual birds, might be staying there. More surprisingly, we had a Eurasian crane show up. 
uh, this was a very important indicator to uh, tell us that many of these cranes are probably going over to Siberia. Uh, this crane was also seen in 2019, or maybe not this crane particularly, but a Eurasian was seen in 2019 at the Bosque de la Pache. So there's some question of whether it is the same bird. We were lucky enough again to see that bird in 2020, uh, just as COVID was hitting. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to see it come back two years in a row. And I am continuing this project uh, alongside my work at Crane Trust. Uh, this was an image we took in 2022. This image uh, was taken at the very last day of April. So uh, our sand hills out in western Nebraska are staying much longer than the cranes in this area. Uh, much longer into the calendar year, but, but probably the, the similar window of time in the sense that they're staying for roughly six to eight weeks. Uh, Overgrowth is a huge challenge for these birds. Uh, despite the fact that there is overgrowth, they're trying to take advantage of the land and, and loaf and uh, make use of the land where they can, but they struggle flying through habitats that aren't really um, made for them. Uh, and they are also using uh, Lake McConaughey in the fall when the waters are low as a temporary stopover on their uh, south migration. This photo was taken in 2020 and they've been reported there ongoing since, um, since then. Many of the challenges we face in the area include um, overgrowth, uh, little to no contiguous plant management or, or habitat management. Um, whether being uh, careful or not, people are disturbing them. And uh, the agriculture is the primary economy there. However, that is kind of a mixed blessing for the birds, as, as many know. And I think we can learn a lot from the central plat as, we, as I progress this story. Um, one thing we can do in the local community is promote easements. We can set up blinds and viewing areas with uh, signs and educational uh, markings. We can educate the community about these birds and other wildlife around them. And we can bring people together in a way to improve the community in a way that's inclusive. Um, and I include original landowners in that. So. Uh, that would be a, a good conversations to have for the land and the importance of its future. And partly thanks to the Central Platte and its success, we have seen a great history of, um, this was a historical image taken last spring. Uh, these birds, the, the whooping cranes have been succeeding in the area. They gathered in the largest numbers ever documented uh, last, about this time last year. And so maybe if we bring that success to to the blue water area, we can succeed not just for cranes, but for all the other spe species. So I do think it's important for our communities to think big, despite how small they are. And of course, there are so many other species that share this land with the cranes out in blue water, to include our plants, our red-winged blackbirds, our bald eagles, our trumpeter swans, and so many more. And so I hope to continue building this project and I look to the wisdom and, of gui will, wisdom and guidance of everyone here and I look forward to hearing all the, everything that you all have to say. And, and um, I, I do have some data in this year that will appear in a later uh, rendition or presentation of this, show, of this presentation that I'll perform at Crane Trust uh, next spring. So if you're interested in seeing the hour-long version, please come to Crane Trust. And uh, if you want to learn more about the story, uh, you can go ahead and, and click that QR code. And I want to thank you for your time and for your patience. Thanks. Thank you, Kylie. Um, next up, we're going to go with Mallory and Patrick. You guys want to make your way up? Mallory James is a wildlife biologist with Headwaters Corporation and works with the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program. And Patrick Farrell is a statistical ecologist also with Headwaters Corporation and, and works on the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program as well. And they will be speaking to us today about uh, the Platte Program and Whooping Crane Selection of the Central Platte River Valley. this up a little bit. <laughs> um, hello everyone, my name is Mallory James, as Matt introduced us. Um, 
and I work in the executive director's office of the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program along with Patrick Farrell and um, we'll be talking to you about the whipping crane selection of the Platte Valley. Um, so those of you that aren't familiar with um, the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program, also known as PRIP or the program, um, we're primarily concerned with the area of the Central Platte River between Lexington and Chapman, as you can see up here on the slide. Um, and the Central Platte River is fed by not only the North Platte Basin, but the South Platte Basin. The program is charged with uh, managing land and water for target species, and one of those target species being the whooping crane. The program's objective for whooping cranes um, is to contribute to the survival of them during migration. And in order to um, kind of meet that goal, the program creates and maintains suitable stopover habitat while they're in Nebraska in spring and fall. Um, and to um, the program uses three performance indicators to monitor its efforts on whether it's meeting this objective or not. So one of those performance indicators is the area of suitable, um, sorry, area of suitable roosting and foraging habitat. On this map, um, you'll see that this is the associated habitat reach that I were primarily concerned with between Lexington and Chapman, Nebraska. Um, the green polygons up there are conservation lands and the blue are program managed lands. Um, as you can see, um, the, the black lines going through this map are bridge segments and the program has aimed to acquire complex lands within about every bridge segment. Um, that way, my, whooping cranes migrating through should encounter um, suitable habitat um, no matter which portion of this reach they cross going north and south. Um, so the program has increased suitable habitat over the years. In 2007, um, they managed about five miles of river channel. 2015, that was about 16 miles. And then currently, the program manages about 30 miles of river channel. Additionally, um, the program manages a total of 13,759 acres of land. Um, so for the other two performance indicators, um, the program uses the whooping crane response to the increased habitat availability, meaning increasing whooping crane use of the habitat equals contributing to um, whooping crane survival during migration. So how do we measure um, the whooping crane use of the habitat we provide? Um, so the program has come up with a protocol to systematically monitor the associated habitat reach for whooping crane use. And through this monitoring, um, we obtain the number of individuals as well as um, the number of days that those individuals stay in the associated habitat reach. Now we could just compare those raw numbers of data year after year. Um, but we would likely have a false indication of more whooping crane use as the, um, the population that comes through is a growing population that's the Aransas wood buffalo population. Therefore, to better represent whooping crane use through time, we use our second performance indicator, which is the proportion of population that uses the associated habitat reach. Um, and to get that, um, we use the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, population estimate, which is um, acquired through a winter survey they do in Aransas. And um, we use that to get this proportion and compare it year after year. Our third performance indicator is crane use days. So this not only looks at the number of birds that use the associated habitat reach, but the number of days they stayed as well. And this accumulates um, for each season. Here you can see long-term trends. Um, for spring and fall. This, the top figure here is for spring and the bottom is for fall. Um, the black line on these figures is the proportion of population each season. And the blue dotted line is the crane use days. Um, as you can see, the spring, the top figure, is um, more variable than the fall. Um, and additionally, we also receive more use in the spring than fall. Our average proportion um, during spring is 6.64%, whereas in the fall it's only 4.94%. As well as crane use days, their um, spring average is 102.3 days, whereas fall is 85.7 crane use days. 
Um, when linear regression is ran for these data, there is no significant uh, long-term trend increasing or decreasing, um, meaning that um, the increase in habitat is not reflected in the amount of whooping crane use that we receive. Um, data from systematic monitoring and telemetry is also used to inform um, management activities on program lands. Um, based on the program's habitat selection analysis, the program informally accepted unobstructed channel widths of at least 650 feet, and as well as unforested corridors of 1,100 feet as highly favorable riverine roosting habitat for whooping cranes. And um, the program's lands are managed to, to meet these standards. Um, the, program has, so the program has a good grasp on um, what whooping cranes select for while they're here in the associated habitat reach, um, but there's still uncertainty that remains on um, what factors influence whooping crane's initial decision to stop or fly over the associated habitat reach. Um, and so the program has laid out how it plans to try and answer that question, and Patrick can discuss that for you guys in further detail. All right, as, as Mallory mentioned, uh, one of our remaining uncertainties with the program is the decision for cranes to either stop or fly over the Platte River and what factors are important for them to consider uh, when making that decision. Uh, our priority management hypothesis that we came up with was that discharge uh, in the river is an important consideration. But we also have these alternative hypotheses that are both uh, manageable by the program uh, such as unobstructed uh, or unforested uh, corridor widths, uh, as well as habitat suitability or land cover. But also there's these other alternative hypotheses that are unmanageable, including time of day, uh, the length of stay a crane had at a previous stopover, uh, the weather the cranes are experiencing as they come towards the Platte River, and then also what point in migration uh, is this bird at when they reach the uh, associated habitat reach. Uh, there, we have three extensive data sources that potentially could be helpful to, to help us answer this question. Uh, Mallory mentioned the, the PRIP monitoring protocol uh, previously. Uh, this is taken once per day uh, based on mostly our aerial flights. Uh, there was a first telemetry uh, location uh, project that uh, birds were fitted with transmitters like you see here in this bottom photo, uh, and they gave uh, locational data every four to six hours. Uh, these, both of these sources have been used to help us identify what's important for birds once they've made the decision to stop over on the Platte River uh, and in the associated habitat reach. Uh, however, they don't really have this, the temporal resolution to help us understand what conditions a bird experienced as they were making the decision to stop or fly over the Platte River. And that's where the cellular telemetry data comes in, where it's, this uh, equipment gives <laughs> locational data every 15 minutes as opposed to once a day or four to six hours. So it's uniquely suited to especially help us understand what discharge a bird is experiencing as it's making the decision to either stop or continuing to fly during migration uh, along the Central Platte River. Here's an example with this cellular telemetry data. Uh, first, uh, we need to understand uh, or determine stopovers and flyovers. So <clears throat> first, we need to identify individual migration uh, events of these marked birds. So here's two, we have uh, one in red and one in green. And then we actually use the uh, information collected with each location uh, kind of ping that includes directionality, uh, elevation, and also speed that helps us determine flight, uh, if a bird's in flight or on the ground. So this bird in green here, uh, the associated habitat reach is in uh, that pale green, the active channel along the central plat is that inserted uh, blue, and then you can see that uh, this, this bird in green is flying and continues to fly, uh, 
past the Platte River, so that would be a flyover. But the bird in red uh, is in flight and then comes down, you can see it in the bump out, has many ground locations. So this bird actually stopped over on the Platte River. So this, this data helped us determine you know, stopovers and flyovers, and then also what information that we need um, to help us get at our priority hypothesis. Uh, again, our, prior, our priority hypothesis was uh, discharge. So what we used was instantaneous river channel uh, discharge uh, at the first location within the associated habitat reach, uh, in this model is in green, or if that wasn't available, it's the last location before a bird passed the active river channel within the associated habitat reach. So in this example here, we had a, a flyover bird. Uh, the time of, of day that that last location um, was uh, occurred was the time that we looked at the closest um, the closest location to active river channel, which would be in this yellow dot. And what we determined, so then we would gather the discharge information from the Grand Island gauge at that time of that last uh, location. We used a similar uh, process to look at unobstructed channel widths, which are, have been found to be important for birds while they're, they've already made the decision to stop over, but look at it at a different scale. Uh, so what we uh, have done is to look up and down the river channel. Uh, in this case, we've looked a mile in each direction from that closest active channel location to that, uh, that determining locational information for each uh, migration event. And what we've looked at are averages and the variability of uh, maximum unobstructed channel width and also this main channel total unobstructed width, width which um, are in ways proxies, but have, are important for, um, you know, have been found to be important for birds. And when we say unobstructed, what we mean is the uh, continuous stretch of active river channel that is lacking tall, dense vegetation. So w when we looked at a full suite to that as of uh, fall of 2020 of this information for this region, what we found is when we looked at stopovers and flyovers, we had this very unbalanced data set, which we are not surprised as uh, this is very similar to the PRIP monitoring protocol percentages that we've seen. Uh, but what that means from a modeling perspective is that we needed to uh, use a deviation of our logistic regression type model uh, to account for that imbalance. Uh, running a preliminary analysis looking at channel width, time of day, and discharge with information from 2017 to 2020, uh, we found a very significant signal of time of day. So every bird that stopped that you see here on this map in the red dots stopped within the last couple hours of daylight. And we were unable to determine the, basically the effect size of, or the importance of uh, flow or channel widths because that signal was so strong for time of day. What we will do uh, given this preliminary, these preliminary findings is to keep gathering variables that uh, will help us get at those uh, hypotheses and that help us explain uh, stopover decision making. Uh, with a full analysis, it'll help us understand the importance of, uh, or the importance of ground conditions, especially those that are manageable for the Platte River program. And then ultimately this will help us to inform land and water management decisions uh, and, and uh, contribute in ways that uh, the PRIP monitoring protocol maybe cannot, but these will complement each other to ultimately help us uh, with the program. And that is it for our piece of the uh, crane breakout session. Thank you.
Thank you, Patrick and Mallory. Um, we are doing good on time, so I'll encourage folks either online or in this group as well to uh, submit your questions uh, to the app, and we should have some time after uh, Dave joins us here and gives the final presentation to go back and answer some questions. Next up, we have Dave Bosch, uh, Threatened and Endangered Species Specialist at the Platte River Whooping Crane Maintenance Trust and he will be giving a presentation on a record-sized flock of whooping cranes observed staging in the Central Platte River Valley during autumn of 2021. Like Matt said, my name is Dave Bosch. I work with the Crane Trust now as a threatened and endangered species specialist. Um, and last fall, uh, uh, 2021, we had the opportunity to observe uh, a very historic event on the Platte River. Um, <clears throat> Uh, prior to this observation, I think the largest group of cranes I had ever seen uh, during migration was uh, like 15 birds or thereabouts. But uh, on November 2nd, uh, the Crane Trust received several phone calls um, from uh, just the public uh, informing us there were several groups of cranes, uh, whooping cranes around uh, the Crane Trust and the, the out of the Wood River reach of river. Um, so. Uh, November 3rd, the Platte River program did their flight, and uh, you know we, uh, at the Crane Trust, uh, myself and others, went out and did some ground observations to collect data, behavioral data on these birds uh, that we were uh, we found out were coming uh, were on the Platte River. Um, and of the groups, I guess there was there was they started off as five individual groups, and you see the group compositions there, everything from uh, two and one on uh, Benfield, which is in the out of the Wood River Reach. Um, all the way up to 13 and 2 along on Mormon Island uh, for group sizes. Over the next few days, we continue to monitor these birds. Uh, just a little background, I guess. Temperatures during this time were uh, cool to moderate uh, during their stay. Uh, winds were light out of the south when the birds moved in. Um, Platte River flows are about that 2,000 CFS, so, um, so nice, nice wide open channels there. Um, and the Northern Great Plains, uh, probably one of the factors that had as much influence on anything as anything was the uh, um, North and South Dakota were uh, experiencing uh, moderate drought, which I'll get into here in a little bit more. Um, November 4th and November 5th, uh, out with a friend of mine collecting data, Colleen Childers, uh, who shot most of these photos for us uh, that, I, that I'm showing today. Anyway, uh, we were out in a blind on TNC's property and and uh, to get some data on a handful of birds. And when we got there, the, the birds kept coming in and, and uh, ended up having a, a combination of 29 adults and, 30, and three individuals, which like I say, 15 was about as large a group I've ever seen. So that was uh, pretty awesome. I was pretty pumped up about it. Um, went back out the next day on Crane Trust property and, and in one of our blinds. And, and lo and behold, we had uh, 37 birds in a single group. And, and uh, so I was really pumped about this and, and uh, got my mind reeling on uh, what this could mean and, and, uh, and what could have led up to this type of event to happen that's never happened in the United States before. Uh, November 6th comes along and the Platte River Program flight happened to pick up uh, a group of all the birds, all 46 of the birds that were in the valley, um, the 39 uh, adults and seven juveniles. At this point, they weren't together. Um, I'm assuming at this point is when they actually joined together on November 6th. Uh, we didn't actually observe them in the field that day other than, other than in this photo. <clears throat> but on November 7th, uh, the Platte River Program flight did catch them in a cornfield, uh, once again acting as a, as a single flock of birds, um, all 46 of them. And like I said, this has never been documented during migration uh, in the United States ever. It's happened up in Saskatchewan and, and uh, down at Aransas, but uh, never during migration in the United States. So pretty historic event that uh, was going on. Once again, they were observed on the Platte River the same day um, as, a, as a single flock of birds. So they went from the one cornfield, I'll show you the locations, the distribution locations here shortly, but. Uh, from the cornfield to the river, and again, acting as a single flock of birds. There's the location of the, of the different sightings, uh, telemetry, Platte River program, and our uh, biologists at the Crane Trust sightings of these birds. 
Um, you can see there's about a five to six mile gap between where they were first seen coming together in that first photo uh, of some birds in flight and some on the ground, um, all the way over to, uh, um, to the east there to where they were observed in the cornfield, then, then again on the river functioning as a single flock of birds. <clears throat> like I say, the northern Great Plains, especially North and South Dakota, were experiencing moderate drought which uh, with the prairie potholes region, that's uh, primary stopover habitat for whooping cranes and, and other migratory birds, uh, given the vast um, extent of wetland habitat there. Uh, when that land starts to uh, see drought, then you start losing some of that wetland habitat and, and uh, makes other locations that within the migration corridor perhaps uh, a little more important. Um, when they're, when they're on the Platte River here or in the Platte River Valley, we observe them in wet meadows, in cornfields, and in the river. Um, and we collected behavioral data on them in all land cover classes we could get our eyes on them in. Um, based on telemetry data, 80%, 86 percent of their time was spent in the river during the daylight hours, which is rather, I mean, not typical, I guess. Uh, usually they'll end up out in cornfields or grasslands or somewhere. Uh, foraging during the day, then back to the river to drink and out to forage again in the afternoon, but that just didn't happen with these with uh, this group of birds. There happened to be four telemetry mark birds in this group, so so we got a pretty good set of data on individual groups. And then when they came together on where the the larger group was going, um, <clears throat> no matter regardless what land cover class they were in, they largely foraged and uh, loafed, so they seemed to be very comfortable, very relaxed while they're in the in the Platte River Valley. 70% um, of uh, about five days into their, their stay here, um, wind switched from a southerly to northerly direction, and about 70% of the birds left. Um, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and then the last 30% migrated about three or four days prior. Um, like I said, they spent most of their time in the river, even though it dropped from around a little over 2,000 CFS down to below 500 CFS. Their behavior didn't change. They didn't stop using the river. They they continued to use the river um, as they did when the flows were higher. Uh, we'll look at some of the wind and temperature data. Um, like I say, they they showed up here on November. Whoop, that was a backwards button, not the arrow button. There we go. On November second and third, when they when they showed up, uh, when the wind switched from a southerly direction to a northerly direction, they uh, seventy percent of them took off. And then again, uh, the re remainder of them took off when the winds were uh, slightly higher um, out of a west northwesterly direction. And that happened to coincide with when the temperatures dropped to, to freezing the next or that night or the, the uh, next morning. So anyway, they had some idea that something was going on because they all took off uh, during that time. The remainder of them did. Uh, again, Platte River flows started off a little over 2,000 CFS when they arrived. Um, they had a... Um, uh, flow shut down uh, due to a planned um, maintenance effort on the uh, hydropower system. So that's why the flows drop so quickly in the next over the next couple days. Then on the um, eighth, uh, the seventy percent left, and then a couple days later, even though flows were stayed stayed low, the uh, the remaining thirty the thirty percent still remained for a few more days till they decided to migrate on. With that, I guess we got time for questions. Maybe I'll, I don't know if Matthew wants me to have a seat, then you just ask questions to the general uh, presenters, or? Yes, sir, Jim. Yeah. Uh, it is submitted to Waterbirds for publication. Um, we haven't got the reviews back yet, so that, that was just submitted here about a month ago. So it, we plan on it coming out, but uh, but it has not came out yet. Yes.
Uh, Testing. The general, okay, you can. So I asked about looking at weather as a factor for why those birds sort of bunched up in the first place. He talks about that being feather, favorable for leaving, but drought being the reason perhaps they didn't have water up north. So I just wondered if you guys look at weather for why they grouped up in the first place. Uh, not necessarily, I, not, not specifically that, no. Um, another important, well, uh, another uh, point to this was the birds actually started off about 100 to 125 miles um, north of the Platte River. Then they made their short migration into a south wind, even though they were migrating south. They did migrate into a, a soft or light south wind, and then they stopped and stayed again. Um, I did not look at weather patterns leading up as they moved through Dakotas and that kind of stuff at all, though. No, I, I didn't look into any of that, no. This is more just a historical note a publication than it was a in-depth research paper, I guess, per se. Any other questions for Dave? Okay, um, we've got about uh, 25 minutes or so before the lunch break. If the rest of the folks want to come up um, and we can ask questions for anyone else here within this group, I do have one online here that I'll read. This one's for Mallory and Patrick. What do you define as associated habitat reach? Why did you use that scale? Okay, so the associated habitat reach, um, I believe, was designated by the Fish and Wildlife Service as, um, I forget the term, uh, yeah, critical habitat. Thank you, Bosch. Yes. So it's between Lexington, Nebraska, and Chapman on the Central Platte River, and then three miles north of the channel and three miles south. Hopefully that answers their question. And just to add on on that one too, um, there is designated critical habitat to, that makes up a component of that under the Endangered Species Act. And that goes from roughly the Shelton Bridge until Chapman. So um, the whole stretch is, is 90 miles and that was, I think, uh, historically picked as what closely lined up with about the 95% corridor that the majority of the whooping cranes migrate through. Um, I had one other question that was online that um, looks like it was answered online, but I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, Amanda, how much do the UV lights cost? I'll let you answer this. You go? There you are. So each ACAS unit was around $17,000, and Dawson Public Power donated their time to install it. Am I, am I right on that, Dave? Around 17000 Yeah, let's just bring all the four groups up here and then we can continue on with questions. Um, I have two questions. My first question is kind of a follow-up to that last one about the ACAS system. Um, I guess you had mentioned that humans don't see ultraviolet light. And I know it was near ultraviolet light, and I was surprised to see the lights in those pictures. So is that, um, I guess, why could I see the lights? Yeah, so bird, or humans, the closest thing that we can see is what you saw purple. So um, since it was near, I think that's why we picked up on it. But in terms of the way it looked, um, illuminating the entire span of the power line, it was completely like you couldn't see it, even in the dark. The only thing that we could see is that there was like a slight glimmer on each power line. Um, but other than that, it was nearly just invisible to us unless you look directly at the lights, <laughs> probably because it's more of a concentrated source. <laughs> Thank you. And then my next question is for David or Dave. Yep. Um, are you able to get the telemetry data 
uh, or other um, ground observations from North and South Dakota, maybe to confirm that they had a decrease in their observations, or do they have this type of monitoring up here where you could maybe confirm the influence of the drought? Um, I have not looked, <clears throat> excuse me, beyond um, Nebraska as far as their previous stopover than their subsequent stopover after they left the Platte River. Um, Matt Raby would be, and his observations, I think, in the Dakotas, he can confirm this or deny it, but uh, he doesn't get near the proportion of observations of whooping cranes from North and South Dakota as he does Nebraska. So I don't know if that data that is in the Fish and Wildlife Service database would be relevant to seeing if there happened to be fewer stopovers last fall or not. I, um, and the telemetry data would be probably as, as good as a person could get. Um, but I don't have access to the full database at this point. We just get, the, get them as the birds are moving through, and then uh, they shut down, and then I'll get it again next spring as they move back through again. Yeah, and just to, to touch on that as well, um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service does maintain a, a public sightings database, and so, you know, between the two data sets, there's different information you can glean, and there's different um, inherent biases that influence each of those data sets. And so um, the telemetry is widely considered, you know, the, the more unbiased in that um, it doesn't have a human element to it. Whereas our database, it's capturing locations of whooping cranes, where they interact and have that, that influence with people being around. Um, specifically with, with that instance, um, you know, I, I can't say that I've looked at, you know, to see the, wh where we were getting the majority of our sightings and when we were getting them for that, that falls migration. I think in general, there are some differences between the spring and fall migration. Uh, you know, that there's a, a staging that goes on in the fall migration in, in Saskatchewan that, you know, doesn't occur in the spring. So that I'm sure has some influence on when and how long they stay in the United States portion of, of their migration um, versus other locations. Yeah, my question is for uh, Mallory. Um, you mentioned about 16 miles of the river stretch and now 30 some miles of uh, area um, Platte River Recovery Implementation Program Office has got into managing. So, um, somebody not familiar with the landscape here, um, how this land, uh, is it in private hands or how did that go into private hands or uh, was, if it is in the flood plan, how that became part of the private ownership? So, I think you're asking how the program acquired the... Who owned it beforehand? It, a lot of it was um, private lands and they were um, willing sellers for the program to purchase, as well as some of them were, um, such as the, the Crane Trust um, acquired lands earlier and sold it to the program um, for them to manage as well. We also have um, basically managed lease agreements. So some of it is still in private hands, but there's an agreement that the program can manage the channel for habitat as well. Is it something from the beginning years of the Homestead Act or how this came to the private ownership or uh, gradually expanded these areas which you are managing now? Oh, well, most of it was, pri I mean, all of it was pretty much private land ownership okay. it, during the homesteading time. Okay. And it's it's become um, acquired for conservation okay. lands okay. Um, with the listing of the whooping crane as an endangered species and the area being deemed critical habitat. Okay. So during the private, I mean, during the homestead, there was no exception that you, you can get land anywhere, not whether the, it is part of the river channel or it doesn't matter or that was the, there was no rule at that time? I, I think so, if, I, if I'm understanding your question right. Any other questions? Take Dana's first. I have just kind of a general question for all the speakers. 
Uh, over the next 10 or 20 years, do you expect that the situation for cranes on the Platte River will get better or worse? And that goes for Santel and whooping cranes. I'll take that one first and then uh, pass it off to anyone else that has a thought on it. I strongly believe <clears throat> the situation is going to stay pretty stable from here forward. I think land acquisition by some of these conservation organizations and the expansion of the program, unless the, unless the program decides to expand beyond their current inholdings, it'll be pretty stable. And on the and the river channel will be managed either through flows or through disking. So one way or another, the cons existing conservation grounds will be what they are. The non-conservation grounds could con continue to shrink. The channels could continue to shrink because uh, of woody encroachment, but. As far as the amount of what I consider good habitat out there for both sand hills and whooping cranes, I think uh, we'll stay pretty steady. Anybody else have a thought on that? Yes. Uh, I'd, I'd mostly agree with Dave, uh, I, but I, I'd say it comes down to a, a, a people decision where, let's say, the, the, the ability of the program to, especially the program, but other, you know, in, in concert with other conservation groups to kind of maintain what is there and especially in ownership and management. If that stays stable, I would, I would definitely agree that habitat suitability, let's say, and availability will, will be similar for birds. Uh, some of that though comes down to those decisions, let's say in 20 years of, from a program perspective of, you know, what do the decision making, what, what does the decision making body want to want to do and some of that uh, is inflexible uh, because of the way the, the program is written uh, but some of that comes down to uh, how much involvement and how big of a uh, footprint does the program is the program going to have in 2040 2050 so I would say it, it again at, at current state it, it'll likely be status quo but it, it depends on those decisions that are made in 10, 20 years, uh, if it stays that way. I agree with Patrick. Uh, I think also what we do at a community level, um, particularly in areas where there aren't any programming, uh, maybe we'll uh, see an improvement uh, in where the conservation track goes for sandhill and whooping cranes. I think there's opportunity for that out west, and I think uh, it's as much of a people decision as it is a community decision. I'm gonna echo that I agree with everybody, <laughs> um, but I'm just a, like a humble land manager in this situation. Um, so from my perspective, um, I think that there's very much the attitude of learning from others within the Central Platte River Valley on how to manage land. And um, we're very much looking to, you know, acquire more land to increase habitat connectivity and, um, you know, improve our connectivity through tree removal and um, gr different great experimenting with different grazing strategies and things like that. So um, I think there's very much an attitude of um, information sharing that I think will, you know, maintain status quo hopefully not get worse. And then, you know, our relationships with local landowners, local farmers and ranchers um, is another positive thing we have going for us. They're very much aware of what is going on with cranes and why they're important. And um, so I think that maintaining those relationships is gonna be increasingly important in the future. Um, just, you know, I know this is the Platte River Conference, um, but um, the Platte River is just a sliver of what they use for a small period of time. And as the greater species goes, um, it's important to um, explain to other areas the importance of whooping crane habitat and um, keeping other um, portions of Nebraska and other states um, on, on track as well um, because they, they utilize all of it. Thank you. Um, I think Melinda had a question, but I'm going to jump in real quick before I forget mine if you're good. <laughs> because mine's short. Um, mine was for Amanda um, on the UV lighting. Is there any physical limitations in the length of that that um, you can operate, you know, under or, um, yeah. Are you talking about like how far of a span do you think, do yep. I think the light reaches? So if the plot was twice as wide there, mm -hmm. is the same technology still available or not? 
Yeah, so um, from, I don't have data to support this, but from a personal observation during our study, I did notice that cranes tended to avoid the um, following span, um, the next segment, I guess, so to speak, um, of the power lines. So not within our direct study span, but they also seem to avoid the next one over. <laughs> and that was as far as I could see. And Dave was also part of the study, so maybe he can answer. Again, no backing behind this, but one of the things, the design of the lights was to um, illuminate the farthest across the channel with a um, somewhat narrower beam and then a broader beam closer. I think if you added a yet a narrower beam, it would stretch further. Um, so I think there's, I mean, I'm not saying we can go for miles here, but uh, I think you guy can go a lot further than the 300 or 250 meters we went plus the additional, like Amanda was saying, uh, um, avoidance that was outside of our viewing area, so. There was a study that was just published in 2022 um, in the San Luis Valley that I mentioned, and that study did find that cranes not only avoided the immediately immediate treated span, but also um, the surrounding spans of the power line. So, you know, like we can't see it, and I think, you know, there's probably a way to test, you know, where the light is. <laughs> but um, I think from their observations, they did kind of support that. Um, they're a little bit more powerful than, you know, the areas that we are personally observing in our studies. Mine's really close, so it fits that it sort of follows Matt's. My question was um, the decreased numbers of birds or flocks that were in your observation area. How did you measure that? Did you do the same conditions? And how did you measure that you had actually had a decrease, sort of avoidance of your area? You had fewer birds, did I get mm -hmm. that right, that entered into your monitoring area that you quantified? Yeah, so it's just differences in numbers between cranes entering our study area when the lights are on and off. Um, among, yeah, yeah, and also, um, as Dave just mentioned, we measured um, different height strata, and so um, our behavior types were defined by not only height but also a reaction type. So, um, if cranes would fly, you know, within five or ten meters of the top of the shield wires, we would we would record that, and then if they um, altered their behavior or if they just in general were flying higher to begin with when they entered our study area at a greater elevation, let's say between 25 and 35 meters um, above the river surface, then we documented that as well. So um, that kind of helped us to parse apart um, the riskiness of their reaction as they entered. Okay, thank you, that helps. Yeah. Anyone else? Just real quickly here, it wasn't that we had less birds, in my, in my opinion, I guess what I observed wasn't that we had less birds crossing the power lines. They were just crossing at higher elevations, which put, us, put them out of our imaginary box, our viewing area. Or we had some um, reverses, just different behaviors that uh, put less birds in that 35 meter tall um, monitoring zone. I have a question. I'll give it back in a second. Um, you, you guys had mentioned the, uh, the, the modeling aspect of, of that research study. Uh, could, you, could you elaborate a little bit on your response variable or variables for that, um, as well as some of those inputs? We can both take a whack at it, but <laughs> um, so basically, we use uh, we use negative binomial models um, to kind of understand how our outcome, which was number of collisions and observations within our study area, um, was affected by a bunch of different covariates. As I mentioned, a bunch of different weather variables. Um, in terms of the observations in our study area, we used river discharge, um, time, you know, and date, and um, uh, max or peak abundance of cranes and um, just trying to think back. Yeah, lots of just things that would affect cranes coming within our study area to begin with because we knew that that would have impact the number of collisions in general and the number of observations. Um, and then in terms of the number of collisions, we did a tiered modeling approach where um, in the second stage, I guess, after the number of observations, we looked at weather. Um, so percentage of moon, presence of moon, 
um, fog and rain, presence of rain, um, a bunch of different things. Um, as I mentioned, wind was the only significant variable that was included in one of our top models. Rain was too, but it wasn't significant. Um, and then in our third stage, we included the ACAS being on or off. And um, then we used a bunch of different bivariate tests, um, chi-squared, things like that, to understand differences in reaction types with our different treatments, um, which would be ACAS on or off. Do you want to add anything else to that? Okay. <laughs> Uh, so this is for David and, and maybe Matt too. You can chime in, but you know, it, it's obviously it's exciting to see this many cranes in one spot. But was there ever a realization or discussion because it's the first time that maybe we don't want this many cranes together at one point in time? Um, you know, this could potentially be seven, eight percent of the population as we know it. So I don't know if that was ever a conversation that came up, or maybe going forward, maybe those are conversations that is this something that we're good with, or are there concerns that maybe should be addressed or considered? You want me to take it or you want to start? I'll let you go ahead and start and I'll, I'll chime in if I got anything else to add at the end. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's certainly something we have considered and thought about. Um, you know, like I mentioned, there is the fall staging in, in Saskatchewan that we've had uh, instances of large groups like this coming together and, you know, things like disease is a concern, but we've also, in fact, there's a, a published paper um, that was put out uh, a couple years back on whooping crane group sizes increasing over time, which is something that we've observed looking back uh, on the public sightings database that the service used. And so, you know, there's, there's two sides to the story. One is that this was a population that, um, you know, was down to less than 20 individuals at one time. And so, you know, Part of that comes with changes in behavior. We think that, you know, uh, there was probably a time where uh, it was not best for all 20 birds to be together and, and migrating together and, and in close proximity. Uh, but as the population has grown, we've seen that there's changes that are, that are occurring and we're seeing these instances of larger groups being more frequent. And one of the things that can come with that is there's also the beneficial side of it that you can look at, which is, um, you know, from a behavioral aspect, flocking together is something that birds use to have more eyes uh, to be able to uh, detect predators. And so, um, and also, you know, social aspects of uh, those interactions and pair bonding and things like that. And so uh, it's something that we do continue to think about because, you know, we're still sitting at, you know, roughly around 550 birds in the Aransas Wood Buffalo population, and uh, that's still a small number relative to, uh, of course, number of other crane species. And so um, I'll leave it at that. Dave, you got anything? Uh, not directly related to that, but I guess one of the, when the program was put together, I guess one of their missions or objectives was to distribute habitat throughout the entire 90 mile reach. So possibly either to attract more birds that are flying that aren't flying over that one land or whatever but also i would assume to distribute use across the whole 90 mile reach so so uh i i see where your concern might be with larger groups showing up in the same spot if there's a avian influenza outbreak or something in that area um but but uh other than that i guess i don't have much to add to it great thanks uh, i got time for maybe one possibly two questions more and then we'll break for lunch if there is any otherwise i'll let you go early any last questions all right good thanks everyone again uh, enjoy your lunch and thanks to all the speakers <laughs>